Sometimes, such as its almost mythical status, you would assume that the 205 GTI was the last good sporty car that Peugeot produced. The only point of debate being which was better, 1.6 or 1.9. But of course, sporty Peugeots didn't end with the 205, there were the 106 and 306 for a start. But more recently there's been the 208 GTI Peugeot Sport and the 308 GTI, both of which have been very, very good to drive. So Peugeot has never truly lost its mojo, it clearly still really understands how to make a driver's car. But even given that, and the fact that Peugeot is going back to Le Mans in the new hypercar class, would you spend £56,000 on a sporty Peugeot? Yes, you heard me right, £56,000, because that's what this costs. This, in case you're wondering, is a Peugeot 508 SW PSE. If you're unfamiliar with Peugeot lingo, SW means it's the station wagon or estate version, and PSE stands for Peugeot Sport Engineered. The headline figures are 355 brake horsepower and 386 pounds foot of torque, which can deliver the car from 0 to 62 miles an hour in 5.2 seconds and onto an electronically limited 155 miles an hour. However, those figures don't tell the whole story. You see, under the bonnet is a 1.6 litre turbocharged four-cylinder petrol engine capable of putting out 197 brake horsepower through an eight-speed automatic gearbox. However, this is augmented with a pair of electric motors, a 109 brake horsepower one on the front axle and a 111 brake horsepower one on the rear axle. So this is a sporty hybrid. As well as having all-wheel drive, the PSE also gets three-mode dampers, Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tyres, a 24mm wider track at the front, a 12mm wider track at the rear, and big 380mm brake discs at the front. So it's got some intriguing hardware. I want to take a minute to talk about the looks, because I think this looks fantastic. Not just in this particular PSE variant, which we'll get to the individual bits in a moment, but just overall. It's a really good looking estate. Gilles Vidal, who I've mentioned before, is responsible for this and the equally good looking little 208. And sadly for Peugeot, he's now moved to Renault. But this striking face, not too big a grill. I quite like the ribbed bits down there. Down here, very snazzy, frameless doors. And then this sort of bit here, look at that. Very BMW, I think, really. Overall, just a really sleek, good looking car. This is selenium grey paint which is specific to this PSE model and it's actually metallic, it looks flat most of the time but in the sunlight it does start to pop a bit. Now the PSE bits you can tell because it's got these three green claw marks down the front, obviously lion claw marks you see, but unfortunately it then just sort of offsets this whole badge here. Incidentally model name on the nose of the car, I'm not really sure about that I mean it kind of works I suppose for 508 but if this was a Porsche Panamera Turbo S E Hybrid Sport Turismo. No, not so much. But yeah, there we are. We've obviously got more kryptonite highlights here. And then these little aerodynamic Phillips here. We've got one here. We've got another one down here, which we've already caught some stones in. And then the final one down here. And they've got stickers on, which are already starting to peel off, which is a bit annoying. And they just, I don't know, they're a bit fussy. And what is overall a very clean design, I don't think you need them. 20 inch wheels on this, look perfectly nice. Overall though, a really striking, very good looking car. The other colours available by the way are Perla Nero Black and Pearl White, so not the most adventurous palette to choose from. Inside, well it's something of a mixed bag really. The first thing you notice is the little steering wheel which is something Peugeot's done for a while and I don't mind it actually, you live with it for a while and you do get fairly used to it, however there does still seem to be a flaw with it because they just don't seem to have found a way of you being able to really see all of the dash. You always feel, even at my height, like just trying to look over the top of it. It's also quite sort of bizarre if you find yourself parking, sort of knowing which way is up, which seems odd because you'd have thought that would be difficult with a round wheel, but somehow it's more difficult with this. There we are. There are lots of nice little design touches in here though. I, I love these keys here that look like a piano. You want to play a tune on them, don't you? They are actually really useful as well though for just navigating around the various bits of the infotainment that you need and want. And in fact, the car setup, which we'll come to in a bit. The materials, they're 
mostly all right. We've got sort of different layers as you go up. I like this carbon fibre effect. I'm sure BMW used to do that quite a lot, but it is, yeah, it's really quite nice. The Focal, or is it Focal Stereo, is okay. It's not the best, but it's, it's pretty good. And I do like the fact that there is a button just here for turning the lane keep assist straight off because it comes on every time you get into the car, like an awful lot of modern cars, but at least you can turn it straight off. In terms of modes, well, we've got electric, fairly obviously, and we've got 26 miles of range, which is, well, it's enough to get you most places locally. I think they'd reckon that most trips to work and back could be covered just using electric only. And you can do a decent speed in electric only as well. You do really need to be able to plug it in at home or at work though, because although you can charge it on the go from the engine using the various settings down here, it does take some time and obviously saps fuel. Then we've got hybrid, which is obviously the sort of the main mode that you use most of the time. It's what it's default, I suppose, is comfort is exactly the same as hybrid, but it just backs off the dampers. So it makes it all a little more relaxing. Talking of comfort, I should just say that those frameless windows, actually, they don't create as much sort of wind noise as I thought they might. It's really pretty quiet on the motorway in here. It's obviously particularly quiet if you're driving on electric power only, and you could be because it will do up to 80 miles an hour without the internal combustion engine kicking in. There is only an 11.5 kilowatt hour battery on board, but that thankfully doesn't encroach on the boot space. 530 litres with the rear seats up, and 1,780 litres with them folded flat. Obviously the hybrid element makes most sense if you can do a lot of short journeys on electric only, but for that you'll need to plan your daily charging strategy. Plug it into a regular socket and it will take 7 hours to brim, but if you hook up to a dedicated 7 kilowatt wall box like this, then it could be back on the road in an hour and 45 minutes. I should have mentioned that there is also a four wheel drive mode for ultimate tenacity when things get slippery, but the question on all your lips is really, what's it like when you put it into sport? And the answer is, well, it's quite quick. I wouldn't say it feels necessarily 355 brake horsepower quick, or 384 pounds foot of torque for that matter. I suppose the torque, it does, because you get that instant response that you expect with electric motors. However, there is a certain element of it with this car that the match between the electric motors and the internal combustion engine isn't quite there. When you come out of a sharp corner like this, you get the instant punch, but then there just seems to be almost a little gap. It's a bit like they've sort of built the bridge 75% of the way across the river, and then you just need to jump the last bit because the engine doesn't quite, it's not quite up and running when the push from the motors runs out. It is, of course, a big, heavy car, this as well. It weighs nearly 1,900 kilos, so actually it needs every bit of its 355 brake horsepower to push all that along. I've liked this little 1.6 four-cylinder turbocharged engine in other applications. It's amazing how much power they can get out of it. I'm not sure though that it really fits the sort of the character of a bigger car like this. You certainly get the feeling that you really need to thrash the little engine and then these paddles aren't the most tactile things to use. If the drivetrain is a little bit underwhelming, the chassis I actually really like. There's a really nice fluidity to the whole chassis and it's actually pretty involving. It turns in sharply and you can trail brake into the corner and get the whole thing just up on its tiptoes in a surprising way for a big estate car. Obviously there's only so much you can do. As I say, it's a heavy car and it will riot of front end grip, but it's pretty transparent in the way that it actually handles. Tighter corners aren't necessarily its thing there. You definitely can feel the longer wheelbase, but you can feel the rear motor kicking in on the way out of the tighter corners, which is nice. You can feel that it's definitely all wheel drive. And then through the longer corners, there's just a nice balance to it. So the 56,000 pound question, would I buy one? No. I like the fluidity of the chassis, but the powertrain doesn't really do it for me in the sporty stakes. Instead, I think I'd look further down the range because I fundamentally like the 508. It's different, it's got some style, it's not a VAG product. And for between 13 and 18,000 pounds less, depending how you spec it, you can get a 222 brake horsepower 508 SW hybrid without the rear motor, 
but with an increased range of up to 39 miles on electric only. That seems to me to make more sense. Then spend the spare cash on something genuinely sporty. So really, 508, yes, really good looking car. In a sporty version, I think you'd have to be a very committed 205 fan, perhaps, that had grown up to want one.